Thank you, thank you all for being here. And um, we're going to talk about changing the narrative, about stereotypes, about ro role models. And I'm just going to jump right in. So Crystal, you're a director, you're a producer, and you're a writer whose work focuses on amplifying the voices of women of color. Um, and your documentary, Little Ballers, follows four diverse 11-year-old basketball players. And your book is all about inspiring black women. What motivates you to tell these stories? And, and why do you think that you're the one to do it? Um, well, first of all, there are a lot of amazing women who can do it. And fortunately, we're seeing more in this television space. But for me, um, I really got started on the Little Ballers documentary because um, I saw a gap in the images that we were seeing of young boys of color and the perception around them. And I felt that it was very important for me as a independent director and independent producer to be involved on every level of the storytelling. Um, one of the ways that I think we as women can control the narrative and shift the narrative is to make sure that we're controlling the narrative that we're in the room, and that we are making sure that the images that are presented of us are authentic. Um, I always talk about, as a director, and I mean most directors I know do spend time in the editing bay with their editor, but you have to be there catching every shot. There was one experience I had where the editor who white male, um, extraordinary editor. I know he meant absolutely nothing by it, but there was a scene in a documentary of an African-American woman who had some challenges with drugs and was just walking her son inside of their home. And he chose to use a shot that showed her pants open. And it was another shot where it could have been from the chest up, but that's what he chose to do. And so. Every shot that you show of an image of a woman, it is important in, in how I approach it that you allow them their dignity, that you don't have to show them in an undignified scenario like that, even though their challenge is what she was going through, it was very important to me to make sure that she was presented in a way that was respectable. And so I try to approach every project that I do that each image that is cut into a film is an image that is authentic and allows the individual their, their dignity. Seems like such a simple idea, and the thought that you know you're one of the first, or in uh, Vera as well, to do that is is mind-boggling. Um, so Vera, as um, a screenwriter and producer, you help shape really complex characters in Orange Is the New Black, BoJack Horseman. You often use stereotypes and then shatter them. Um, is confronting stereotypes ever top of mind, or are you just trying to tell an authentic story? I would say that it is always top of mind, because if, you, if I don't take the top of mind approach, um, I just don't know if it will come to the forefront. And it's sort of my way of owning my experience and my leadership in the room to be like, continually bring that up. And luckily, I'm in a place now where I can bring that up. And it's appreciated in the rooms I'm in. And then I also try to empower the people around me to get thinking about things in a way that's just diverse in many different ways. Like, how are we looking at how we're portraying people who are of a religious background, or the, the age our characters are, and constantly challenging ourselves to walk that line of like, are we checking ourselves in the room when we're creating these stories? So it has to balance that it's still fun, it's still an interesting narrative to tell, but making sure that I advocate that it's an environment where you can, any writer in the room can challenge and ask questions and check our own biases. Like, I'm not immune to being like, having a certain idea and making sure that I've led by example so that it's like, oh, if I'm like, well, why, do, why are we presenting this character this way? You kind of allow the other people in the room to also ask those questions. If you don't have the, that environment where people can challenge um, leadership and the authority in the room and ask those questions, I think it's really hard to do that. But I really tried to lead that way because it's like, that to me is um, how we're going to shape the narrative. 
Do you ever throw anything out that feels too stereotypical? Yes, Const okay. we're constantly, because I think we are all trying to do our best. Um, we have our, we put forth our best effort in the room, but if something is really aff affronting to someone in the room, and the key is, as Crystal said, to have a room that is diverse in ways that you know, even beyond what you imagine. Have people who are from a different geographic region, different age, different socioeconomic, so we can make sure that if someone is getting that feeling of like, why are we telling this story that is an environment where it can be like, you know what, it's really hard to come up with a story, but if we need to throw it out and come up with something that is inevitably, inevitably going to be more interesting, let's do that. Um, and I love working on shows where that's the climate of like, we can, we can do better. Right. So Gina, first of all, congratulations. Gina just won the Texas primary in her congressional district. <laughs> and she won really big too, which is, which is what I like to add. Big, not yes. bigly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So Gina, you're openly gay. Right. You're raised by a single mom right. who was an immigrant. Uh, you served in the Air Force, and then you've had a great career in national security and intelligence. So you don't just confront stereotypes, you blow them the hell up. <laughs> As a Texas politician, that doesn't seem like a resume that we've ever seen before for a Texas politician. So. Um, I have to believe that being true to yourself, or I want to believe that being true to yourself, in the end, helped you, not hurt you. Yeah. Tell us about that and your decision to say, this is who I am. Yeah, this is, you know, everything that you just mentioned, I mean, that doesn't just happen, right? And so I've talked openly about, look, there's not a lot of kids uh, that go from reduced lunch to executive office of the president, which is the last place I was working before I decided to run for office. And I say that doesn't just happen, right? I mean, I know exactly, I worked hard and I studied hard, but my country and my community invested in me. And that's what this race is about. It's about protecting those opportunities that allowed me to grow up healthy, get an education, and serve my country. Uh, but to your point, yeah, I'm very open about, uh, you know, some folks would say, you know, what's it like running as an, as an openly uh, out person in Texas? And I say, well, I talk about my experiences, for example, being an ROTC cadet at Boston University. Uh, and I liken that to you know, some of the needless anxiety that our dreamers in Texas face. And you know, between Texas and California, that's almost 50% of this country's dreamers, 4,000 of which live in this district alone. Uh, and I should say, this is the district that runs from San Antonio to El Paso. That's like from Manhattan to Raleigh, right? Or from San Francisco to San Diego. 40% of the U.S. borders in this district. It's a majority minority district. So I say, look, when I was an ROTC cadet at Boston University, don't ask, don't tell applied to me. So I know exactly what it's like to live in fear that something that I have worked hard for, right, my opportunity to get an education, my opportunity to serve my country could be ripped away from me and, and, and I could have nothing, and that would have nothing to do with it. I could not help that situation. So I think we owe it to our dreamers at the University of Texas, El Paso, or at the University of Texas, San Antonio, to you know, keep the promise that we made to them, because I know exactly uh, that we, you know, what it's like to live in that, and it's needless, especially when we, frankly, they're, they're American in every sense of the way, uh, every sense of the, of the word, and we should keep the promise that we made to 800,000 people. Wow. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about this, this concept of, of being role models. Um, Vera, you tr talked about trying to form an identity in a vacuum uh, and not seeing yourself on TV when you were growing up. How did that come into play? It's the reason I'm a TV writer. Um, I think it's like, I remember watching TV and maybe growing up in a community at the time where just trying to figure out where you belong, who are you like, and you know, the women I looked up to were, I feel like today I'm dressed like the mom from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. You know? <laughs> because I was like, those were the women who kind of looked like me, you know, Claire Huxtable, and I was just trying to figure out what, which was a family like mine. Um, and I eventually came to a place where I realized the only way to change the narrative is to have the representation in the room. The only person who can control the narrative is for me to be there and be like, well, why don't we make them like this? Or my family, here's another way to look at it. And you have to be of the experience in order to change the way 
um, TV and films are made. So that was really my trajectory um, besides like an obsessive love of writing and TV. And, but that is a direct result from just growing up and trying to figure out, you know, as a South Asian kid in Toronto to be like, which category do I belong to? I want to belong to one of these categories. And so I feel like now we're in a kind of an amazing environment where there are so many different ways to have these different experiences on TV. And that's an awesome thing to be a part of. I just want to actually add yeah. to that. That's a, an excellent point. When I did this documentary also, Little Ballers Indiana, which profiled um, a girls basketball team. It was a three-part docu-series for Nickelodeon. And I remember getting into a very heated debate with the um, executive at the network because they wanted to take out a scene um, with three black girls of varying hues, varying hair types that were, after a game, in the bathroom all doing their hair. Um, one, you know, was trying to put it in an afro puff and was struggling with that. Uh, another one was trying to do some braids. Another one had a straighter texture of hair. And each of them had issues surrounding self-esteem. And I juxtaposed that scene to a WNBA player who was in the film and shared her experiences of playing basketball and first coming into the WNBA and not sure how she should look. She was like, I wasn't sure if I should have a weave down my back because I could get more endorsements with that look, or I wasn't sure if I could have an afro, but here I am today and I have partial braids and partial afro. And it was a really important discussion. And I remember the network executive, um, but extraordinarily creative mind, but she was like, oh, I, I just don't see, think that that scene has any value. Um, let's just, just cut it out. And I went back and forth and I remember saying, I will pull this show <laughs> before I allow you all to take that scene out. As an African-American woman uh, with African-American daughter and a responsibility to all the young girls out there that look at TV and don't always see themselves represented, I said, there's no way I'm removing that scene so you all can make the decision. It's my responsibility to show the images of the spectrum of beauty of young girls. So it stayed in. Well, <laughs> a little bit about that responsibility. You just used that word, and that's actually what I wanted to ask you. Do you feel like, as women who are aware right now that we have a responsibility to be telling and safeguarding these stories, just like you did with that one? Well, it is my, my, my privilege, my honor to even be able to do this work, number one. And so, I stand on the shoulders of great storytellers um, that came before me that were, were first, that sh quashed stereotypes, that knocked down doors in a, a much more challenging environment than what I'm experiencing right now. But we, that's not enough. We, we have to continue. Um, I just want to say one other thing before, I don't want to hog up all the time, but I just want to talk about something positive in the space of, of images as it relates to studies being done around implicit biases. I also did a documentary on the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, which is headed by a woman by the name of Sherilyn Eiffel, who's really on the front lines of civil rights work, voting rights work. Um, LDF is the one on the front lines doing amicus briefs to um, you know, shoot down the Muslim ban. Um, one of the professors in the documentary by the name of Philip Atiba Goff spoke about implicit bias in a study called The Innocence Project. And this was something, I'm saying this because this was something I fought to keep in the film also. And essentially The Innocence Project was that the essence of Innocence Project was a study that was conducted between willing police departments and communities where they went around the country and determined that police officers on average aged up black boys by four and a half years. So Tamir Rice, 12 years old, who was shot within 30 seconds of the police pulling up, aged him up almost to 18. And in the field, it's 20. They aged him up to 20, actually, in the field. So I just looking forward, because when we had our like, pre-call about this, we talked about how can we be solution-oriented. Studies like that, where we have police 
working with, with professors and communities to figure out how we are going to make sure that these implicit biases that we all have in various forms are confronted and a light shined upon them uh, is something that I'm also committed to doing. And hopefully we can, there was also one on women and the women, African-American women are also aged up by four years and that was the Georgetown study. And just to echo what Crystal's saying, in that sheet that you got there, the first thing is, is a link to the implicit associations test. And, you know, everybody I know, including myself who took that, it shows your biases. And it's really, really important to just, and again, this is what brains do. This does not make you a bad person, but you need to be aware of what your biases are. You need that wake up call. Um, and I'd encourage you to ask other people to take it as well. Um, Gina, what, what does it mean to you that some little girl in Texas is seeing you run? And, and how do you think that could change things? Yeah, look, I'd be honored to be you know, the first out member of Congress from Texas, the first woman ever to represent this district in Texas, the first Iraq war veteran to serve in Congress from Texas, the first Filipina American ever to serve in Congress. Uh, but it is more important that I am not the last. <laughs> I, I hope everybody heard what she said. It's more important it's, that I'm not it is the last. It is, that's the most important thing, that I am not the last. Um, and I will just say this, though, you know, coming from a completely different field of national security, uh, if there's ever a community that, is, that needs as diverse of, of, of experiences, socioeconomic backgrounds, education levels, it is the intelligence community. It is our national security. Uh, and I wrote a piece after Charlottesville last year where I made this point. I said, white supremacy is a threat to national security. And this is why. Because if, you, if the next generation of Americans are looking up at their current public servants, their president, their attorney general, their representative, and those people are making disparaging comments about them that, sh that show that they see no value in the next generation of Americans, then the next generation of Americans are going to see no value in public service. And that is a threat to national security. Having worked in the intelligence cell that supported uh, the Arab Spring, if you don't understand Ferguson, if you don't understand Baltimore, you are not going to understand why that young man set himself on fire in Tunisia. Those are essentially about the same economic and social economic injustices and inequalities. So not only does you know, diversity make for better pictures, but in long term, it's a national security threat if we don't have people that think that public service uh, is a viable path for them, because we need those experiences. We need uh, people checking our, own assumptions, checking our assumptions, right? Diversity makes for a better society, right. period. Yeah. And, and I think to the issue of what more can everybody do, in your places of work, um, you know, in your communities, make sure when you walk in a room, it's a diverse room. If there's not enough diversity in your company, fight for it, push for it. You know, if there's not enough diversity in your community organizations, do the same thing. It's really, really important to have everybody in the room. So, in the midst of a rather dark time, that's all I'll say, um, <laughs> there has been these incredible leaps in, especially in storytelling, and I'm thinking of Wonder Woman and Black Panther, which just <laughs> defied <laughs> absolutely all the Hollywood truisms about what makes a commercial success. And the other thing is there's more women running for office than ever before. So there's these really bright spots. Um, Gina, do you feel people underestimate the power to make change through their choices? I think so. And I think, though, you know, in no small part, the young people from Florida are reminding us <laughs> and reminding talk show hosts uh, <laughs> just how powerful uh, they are. And I think, you know, th there is something to be said as, as folks, frankly, are, are, are better consumers sometimes than they are citizens. And when we were just talk earlier talking about kind of voter, uh, voter registration, voter participation. So we do have to remind people that, uh, yes, it is about showing up at the ballot box, but it, it is also about where you choose to invest your resources um, and to understand where that dollar is ultimately ultimately going, is that going to somebody that is going to vote against your rights uh, on, on whether it be access to safe reproductive services, whether, the, whether they're going to vote to uh, keep your district gerrymandered, right? whether they're going to vote to keep and Citizens United, uh, uh, or whether they're going to keep actually big money in politics. So understanding, following that through, I think, is important. Uh, and then we only change that right, by having voices that are willing to call those things out.
great. And so, Vera, do you think like the success of these two films are anomalies, or have we, you know, crossed the Rubicon? Are you know, is this our, the new way? I don't think we've crossed the Rubicon, and I think currently they're actually anomalies that can change how we move forward. But the numbers, you know, don't lie because I think that. We have had a few successes, but when you those reports come out every year where it says, this is how many women writers, this is how many uh, female uh, directors, um, uh, directors of different backgrounds, shows about women of different backgrounds, I'm not seeing those things on the air yet. Um, I think there are a few exceptions, but I think that hopefully this shows kind of the entertainment industry that these can be money makers and then I'm hoping that it will help us actually cross the Rubicon where we see like more shows than we have insecure but we need more sh shows about women, women of different backgrounds and I'm not quite seeing that and every year those reports come out and I really look at it I'm like oh wow we're only two percent or oh it's only one and a half percent here so I think they're the proof will be in the pudding and, I, and I'm still waiting to see that part. Right. And tied into that, Crystal, um, how do you think people in the audience can help change the narratives that, that we tell in, in Hollywood and, and in politics? How, how can they help change those narratives? Well, I think that we've seen a, a great example of that with the support some of the films have gotten, some of the TV shows have gotten um, that showed great success at the box office. I mean, you look at a film like Girls Trip that was a all-black cast, basically, um, $100 million at the box office. You look at films like Black Panther that, you know, billion plus, but also performed internationally, which is oftentimes one of the reasons why studios will say, oh, well, we won't, you know, do this film with this black cast because it's not going to perform well. And then you have a wide array of um, businesses that are being established that are committed to, you know, like Macro, um, Charles King's company, that is committed to telling high-end stories um, surrounding diverse casts. They did Mudbound. They did Fences. Um, and then you have, like, a, you know, a small production company like Crystal McCrary Productions that I've gone outside of the system to get movies made, to get television shows made, and have created this network that gets our work disseminated. I mean, you look at Ava DuVernay, like everyone knows who Ava DuVernay is now for her amazing work as a director, but prior to her coming to, you know, like this international attention, she had this company, Array, that actually um, produced and distributed programming and films made by people of color. So I think when we figure out how we can collectively support um, diverse stories, I think it's using our networks. I think it's, you know, everybody knows how to use social media pretty well, and we see, we see what happens with, with Twitter and, the, you know, the, the, you know people, people talk about black Twitter, but it's real. <laughs> and messages get spread around with, with that, you know, tune in. But I think that what's important to me moving forward is also the intersectionality between women of color black women, Latino women, um, Asian women, white women, we really do have to figure out how we come together. We have to come together creatively. We have to come together politically and not being on a soapbox, but we need to figure out how we're going to put aside differences and come together heading into these 2018 midterms um, in 2020 because um, we're all in danger of our voices being suppressed if we don't make sure that um, we're not living in a dictatorship. <laughs> Dark times. <laughs> um, what are some of the ways, Vera, that we could, uh, in storytelling, can move the needle that statistics and, you know, like you were referring to those statistics and reports can't? Like, what's the power of storytelling that you've seen in, in terms of making change? Um, I think it's like, it's, again, to bring it back to like, when you see yourself 
reflected on TV, when you see a part of your story in someone else's story, it makes you feel like you have value. And I think that I've really struggled with kind of, because what we see on TV, we're like, oh, these are the interesting people. They have stories to tell. When you can change the narrative, you empower people in a little way to be like, oh, I have a place in this world. My story is one that's worthy of telling. Um, and I think that can have like ripple effects beyond what we can even imagine. So I, I, I just believe in it so strongly as a woman who, who grew up being like, oh, I guess I don't matter if I'm not, if my story, my family, my background isn't reflected at all on TV, except for a punchline, you know? So I think that it gives us value and we'd be crazy to deny not seeing ourselves in entertainment means something to its different audiences. So, I, I would just, encourage you all to own your own stories as well, and especially if you're a young person, a young person of color or LGBTQ, share your story. Um, it's really meaningful if people, um, proximity helps. It helps break down walls, and, and knowing people's stories really breaks down walls more than anything does. Um, I just have one question left, so I want to, Gina, ask you, how could we as an audience help you as a candidate, candidates like you, we think, oh, she's running in Texas, we live in California or New York. You know, what should we be doing? Yeah. Well, first, uh, you, thank you. Right? This is, is helpful, right? Just highlighting candidates, highlighting races that are key to flipping the house, right, and really being that accountability and that check on, on everything that's going on right now. Um, but frankly, if you're not running for office, you should be helping a woman run for office. Yes. Uh, <laughs> please, right? I mean, look. I mean, you're talking, or it's interesting, we're talking about narrative here, right? The narrative in Congress, the policies that they come, are reflective of the fact that it's 80% male, 80% white. And that is not, that does not reflect the, uh, the issues, the concerns uh, that are throughout this country. So uh, please, you know, support by, by sharing the messages via social media, but also, frankly, you know, contributing is also very helpful. Until we can get money out of politics, this is, you know, don't hate the player, hate the game, until we can change the game. <laughs> Um, but also, please. Yeah. Um, uh, but again, there are a number of uh, record women running. Um, I would, I will say, just one this, one last point on this, just because of, of the kind of press audience that we've got here. You know, when they t start um, putting forth a narrative that you know to not be correct, I, I guess, I've been a little bit surprised at um, at sometimes the lack of check. And in a narrative, what is so important? The common understanding of each of the terms. Right, so when people are somehow now, for example, changing the record on an issue, and that then causes them to be called, for example, a moderate, well, if you know that that's not true, we need people showing, like, no, 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 that person actually voted to deny women access to reproductive services after 20, after 20 weeks. Right. No, 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 that person actually challenged the constitutionality of DACA and voted, voted to defund DACA. So we've got to hold folks accountable, and it can't, we can't, and frankly, me running, and I think like so many other women, we're just done assuming that somebody's going to carry our own water. So if the story is not written, please write it. Yeah. Thank you all so much. I think that you heard the message here. We're in this together. Support the women entrepreneurs in the back. Support the women candidates. Support the women filmmakers and the shows that are showing women the way you know they really are. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.